Hello, welcome back to Generational Ministries with short stories. Today's short story is entitled, Crime Scene Investigation, What Killed the Church? Now that is kind of heavy right there, because a lot of our churches today, you know, they're not as vigorous as they used to be. The church used to be like the heart of the community. That's where you went for to con- for to console your own soul and have some inspiration that you would use to carry you through the next week and you would fellowship together and just you know somebody to get some help from that's what the church was supposed to be when Christ you know first introduced the church it was supposed to be a hospital for the sick souls but today it seemed like it's anything but. So we're going to take a look at this today. Again, it's called Crime Scene Investigation, What Killed the Church? Now caution, this lesson is R-rated and not attended for the squeamish or the faint of heart. So let's begin. The scene we arrived upon is a gruesome sight to behold. There's darkness and faint cries for help as some poor soul tries to make contact with the rescue unit. There's a smell of rotten flesh as we move in closer to the scene. Birds of prey hover over us as we attempt to make out what manner of place is this. A bright square of yellow tape marks off the premises. The building is still a bit too far off to make out what it is. We press forward. Through the wreckage of what we sensed used to be a place of welcome and peace and light. As we get closer, we can see through a dense fog of heaviness and darkness what looks like a steeple. Oh no, the place we are at has been identified as a church. Oh my goodness, there has been a horrible tragedy. The rescue units move in. There are no survivors. The scene is a mess. There's a quiet stillness as the victims are carted up and loaded onto the rescue units to be taken to the medical examiner's office. Dozens of units are employed to expedite the process of crime solving. And what has happened here is indeed a crime. No one must be allowed to interfere as the medical examiner or the Holy Spirit completes his investigation and find out what killed the church. Now, as we just said, the medical examiner in this story is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is nothing but truth. The truth is usually two different sides to a story and then you had a third side. It's the straight up truth. And that's where the Holy Spirit lives at in the straight up truth of anything that's going on. So the medical examiner rolls up his sleeves as he prepares to unravel one of the most horrible mysteries he's ever faced. It's going to be a trial ordeal as he sorts through all of the evidence. As he views the heartbreaking scene before him, he decides to begin his investigation of the leaders of the church first. He placed them each on a table and beginning with the pastor, then the associate minister, next the deacons, and the administrative staff, trustees, financial officers. All these are stretched out, vulnerable before him, nothing hidden as he began his gruesome task. First, the pastor. What brought him to this point? As the medical examiner gazes down at him, He remembers the day he was called to carry the word. How excited he was. So full of passion for God. So willing to go where he was sent. Sometimes he worked for free. So eager that he was to represent God. No assignment was too many for this young ambitious pastor. The medical examiner remembers well the day he was ordained. How humble he was. Out of a sincere heart he cried tears of joy. Looking down at him, the medical examiner recalls his joy when he received the commission to pastor his first church. 
How excited the young pastor was. Dedication and commitment led him to the heights that he never before reached by such a young person. Somewhere along the way, he developed a disease we refer to as the Nebuchadnezzar syndrome. Instead of praising God and giving God credit for the success of his ministry, the pastor begins to take credit for the wonderful things that had happened in his life. He began to look down on others that was not as eloquent in their speech as he was. He was impatient with those not as smart as he. He started to use phrases like my church or my pool pit or my program, my time. He began to take God's glory for himself. As the medical examiner sums up his report, he hasn't even had to use his scaffold to identify the cause of the death for the pastor as is clearly resulting from death of a proud look. Wow. The medical examiner moves on to his next study case. There are about six of these victims. They are associate ministers. The medical examiner can't see the cause of death just by casual observation. They seem to be intact. Yet here they are, dead from some unknown cause. The ME pauses for a moment. He's remembering the day that they too had been called to minister. He remembers specifically that two of them were souls had to be called to minister service of music. Another had been called for prison ministry. Two had been called to deliver the word of sister and the pastor and some had simply been instructed to come out of the world and live a life that is pleasing to God and to be an example for the saints to follow. Some days these associates did a pretty good job. At the beginning of their ministry they were fired up and ready to go. There was only one problem. Things didn't move as fast as they wanted them to. Their days were filled with study, or they should have been. Much of their time was spent waiting and watching and listening. The glamour begins to fade because they didn't want to do this. They considered this drudgery. Instead of coming to church on Sunday, on, when they wasn't prepared or on the program, they stayed home. So if they weren't on the program, they decided, oh, well, I don't need that. I'm staying home and said they were in other worship services, which wasn't true. Instead of Sunday school, they slept in, sending the excuse of being sick or tired. Instead of Wednesday night Bible study, they said they had to work, all the while packing their ball for bowling with the boys. As the days went by, they grew more and more resentful of the number two position and began saying things like this. The pastor doesn't like me. Oh, he has his favorites. No one is supporting us anyway. That's why I don't want to participate anymore. See, because they want the head person they didn't want to do. So after cutting open these victims, the medical examiner makes his pronunciation of death. We'll call this one Jacob's disease, or in other terms, a lying tongue. Okay? The medical examiner moves on to the deaconry. Oh, it's a lot of blood here. The interesting fact noticed by the ME is that the blood does not belong to the victims. Hmm, this blood comes from another source. The members of the church deacon board had a responsibility of caring for the needs of the communion table, the pastor, and the church congregation. These are people of great communication skills, scriptural knowledge, and character that inspires confidence among the pew, or at least they're supposed to be this way. So why are they here in the medical examiner's office? And why so much blood? The ME noted, that several of the deacons are not as trustworthy as they appear to be on Sunday. Some of them align themselves with the pastor of our story and begin to brainwash the pew by teaching false doctrine. Oh yeah, deacons are supposed to be apt to teach and serious about what they're doing. 
The diggings were double tongued. The medical examiner noted this after prying open the mouth. Some of the diggings spent a little too much time at the ABC store, and not and these weren't stencils for teaching them. And sadly, some of them were plain old fashioned greedy. They never wanted to spend time and funds to upgrade the church. They bought the cheapest material they could find when it would come time to do some. And for what? Just to watch the treasury grow? The examiner noted that these leaders set a poor example for the saints by not supporting the Sunday school program, the midweek Bible study, afternoon services, and other outreach ministries. All of the ailments played a part in the death of the dignity. However, the examiner will report the main cause of death as we will call Cain's complex. In other words, hand that shed innocent blood. The ME, after further inspection of the hands of the deacons, noted that the blood came from the children that they led poorly. People whose confidences they broke by putting their business in the street. The homes that suffered from the lack of counsel and funding that was never given to them. The blood poured from their hands that no longer passed the communion bread and wine. Yes, indeed, innocent blood is on the hands of these people that was once so dutiful and faithful. Oh, how sad. The medical examiner presses on in this depressing and gruesome ordeal. His own heart aches as he cuts open the chest of some of the members of the board of trustees and the financial staff and even the clerks and missionaries. These people all died from what we would call Haman's heart disease. Many of them were distrustful of leadership and felt as if their jobs were too behind the scenes. They wanted to be up front and seen, you know. They felt like if somebody didn't see them, it wasn't that important. But every job is important in the church. Everything, just like your body. Some things you can't see, like your heart, but it's pumping away. They became angry and resentful when the pastor unfailingly thanked the choir, the ushers, and the musicians for their part in the service. They wanted people to be aware of what they did. Long hours of adding finance and preparing programs and closing land deals and overseeing business transactions and the countless days spent visiting the sick and shut-ins. Their heart was no longer filled with gratitude now, though, and a love of service. The medical examiner notes the black sticky malice that's attached itself to what used to be hearts after God. Now the arteries of these once caring individuals have been clogged with bitterness because they felt that services were being taken for granted and they thought that they were entitled to more honor. In other words, notes the ME, these hearts devised wicked imaginations and they simply gave out. Heart can't pump. The medical examiner continues on. In another corner of his room, there are tables with ushers laying on them. Now what in the world happened here? As he pondered this question, he realized the main thing of what ushers have in common is they all must use their feet to serve. When he pulls up the sheet on each of the victims, he noticed their feet are all covered with boils and bruises, and they are black with gangrene. Oh, how horrible, he thinks, as he uses his scalpel to cut open the rotted flesh. He names this disease Balaam's Bunyan. These now useless feet used to walk up and down the aisle in dutiful service. They were feet that were always present and on time for the meeting. The medical examiner clearly remembered the gangrene set in on these feet. He remembered when it started. It started when they wouldn't come regular to scheduled meetings. They wouldn't dress out in the uniform which were required. They would sit down at funerals instead of standing up doing their job. The times that they did show up to participate, they always brought trouble with them. Strife and confusion 
rain in the meetings and on the floor. The ushers no longer shod their feet with the shoes of peace. They preferred instead to keep trouble going. Cause of death, noted the medical examiner, feet that were swift to run to mischief. Oh man, this is getting gruesome. Moving on to another section of the room, there are several tables lying still and quiet are the counselors and the teaching staff of the church. Now surely a mistake has been made here. These upstanding and intelligent people would be too smart to be caught up in any unrighteousness. They knew too much. They knew they had to study to show themselves approved to God and not ashamed of the gospel. They knew they had to rightly divide the word of truth. The medical examiner remembers when they used to teach by example as well as by word. He cuts them open and he discovers what he'll call Hananiah's hypocrisy. They were teaching one thing and living another. They started showing up late. Classes begin at 9.30. They breeze in at 10 o'clock and proceed to push their own agendas when they talk. They taught materials not consistent with the rest of the Sunday school. They had no idea they were killing the church when they started to teach based on their opinions rather than on the Word of God. They stopped using the Bible, preferring instead to use worldly material to teach spiritual truths. See, the two don't go together. You can't use worldly principle for godly teaching. It just don't work. Clearly, the cause of death here is false witness speaking lies. The medical examiner moves on to another section of the room. Here he finds the most abominable death that is. Lying on these tables are the choir leaders and the directors and their personnel. After cutting open the victims, he discovered all died from what he refers to as Martha's malady. Instead of cooperating and working together, the choirs and their leaders begin bickering among themselves. Some want to lead all the songs, others making fun of those with less talent. Some want to have their own individual budget and anniversary. Some won't come to practice, leaders showing favoritism. Some always telling something on someone else the cause of death sowing discord among the brethren. So that means simply starting trouble, running back and forth with lies, telling this thing, then the other, and just simply being a, a nosy busybody. So the medical examiner continues his work as he now comes to the table of the lay people. Now the lay people is your congregation, the people are just out there listening to everything. These people that come to church every Sunday hopefully coming to get something that's going to help them in their life. So the lay people is all the other people besides the ones we just went through. There's a whole lot of these. So there's hundreds of them. The enemy grabs as he lowered his scalpel and began. Opening the first church or chest, he finds one died of adultery. Oh, good. My goodness. Another reveals the cause of death as fornication. And there are several of these. Another open chest reveals hearts of uncleanness and lasciviousness. That just means you just do any and everything on a regular basis. You don't care what you're doing. You don't care who sees it. You're just out there doing your thing. Okay. Another gaping chest is called idolatry. Now, idolatry played a major role in the death of several victims. You had backbiting, gossip, pettiness, contrariness, all that killed the church. Some were found with stab wounds in their back by someone they trusted. Now, all the stuff killed the church. Crystals and tarot cards, manipulative spirits revealed witchcraft among the people. As he continued, the stench of hatred rose up. Variance and jealousy, oh, jealousy almost overpowered him. He presses on to discover that hearts that were once soft and malleable 
are now cold, hard lumps of blackness that harbor strife, sedition, heresy. He just didn't have anything to work with anymore. Further, in his investigation, revealed murders, drunkenness, revelings, and he finally finished and sums up his report. The medical examiner concludes, there was no way that this church could have survived such internal damage. He also notes that death was not a sudden death, but one that happened after a long period of time and over time. When no one stood against these practices, they were accepted as the norm and they were continued to allow to go on. It was a subtle slow poison that was not di diagnosed until it was too late. Having progress to the final stages of spiritual disease, that's what finally killed the church. The medical examiner finished his report, removes his latex glove, and before taking off his glasses, he enters a postscript on his notes. Proverbs 16, chapter, Proverbs 16, verse 25. There is a way that seems right to man, but the end of that way is death. That's really something hard to read for me because I love the church. But the truth being said, the church is involved in a spiritual death. And the way that we can stop that is to change our hearts and our minds and ask the Lord the same way that David did to create in me a clean heart and a right spirit. So that's what we would want to do. When you feel like you finna say something that you know is not right, just hold your peace. Don't say it. Because it seems like it may not be causing a problem, but just like the medical examiner said, or either the Holy Spirit in this case, you know when you're wrong. You know when you're saying and doing things is not pleasing to God. Don't do it. You know, let's just try to to control ourselves. Because we don't body love a bit of gossip more than a church-going person. They can take that thing and just tear it to pieces. But we got to stop doing that. We got to separate ourselves from the practice of the world. That's what worldly people supposed to be doing. It's not what we're supposed to be doing as Christians. And I just want to make a distinction. It's a difference between a churchgoer and a Christian. Churchgoers can be into anything because you, you can't tell them no different from, from one to each other. But a Christian... You can see the difference. They think different. They speak different. They carry themselves in a different way. They don't talk a bunch of mess and junk all the time. You just don't see it. You'll notice that they walk different. My little grandson sings the song, I Got a New Way to Walk. And that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to walk differently after we let Christ in our life, in our hearts. So thank you for listening. This has been an insert from our short story series, CSI, What Killed the Church. Thank you.